Hello, and welcome to the Soundstage Audiophile Podcast. In this second season of the show, host Jordan Guth is joined by a new guest each episode who knows something about hi-fi that Jordan doesn't. And who knows, while he's learning about all of this, you might learn something too. So with no further ado, here's Jordan and this week's guest. Hello, my name is Jordan Guth, and welcome back to the Soundstage Audiophile Podcast. Today, we are joined with Joseph Taylor, who is the senior editor for Soundstage Experience. Um, Joe is known for his in-depth articles on vinyl, CDs, uh, everything music and, and the experiences around them. And uh, he has quite a wealth of information on uh, not only the music, but the, the technologies that create the music. So welcome, Joe. Thanks. Good to be with you. So today, I, I just kind of wanted to start the conversation on uh, vinyl and, and getting kind of a sense of how vinyl is rooted in hi-fi audio uh, and then kind of see where the conversation goes from there. How does that sound? For most of, of my life, or at least my life as someone who lis- who's been listening to music, hi-fi meant vinyl and reel-to-reel tape. Um, now, I've never owned a reel-to-reel machine. They're big. They take up a lot of room. They're pretty expensive. Uh, and records were in every shop you went to, whereas tape uh, was not something you'd usually find in a record store. You'd probably have to track it down. Uh, So for, again, for me, vinyl's what what music meant. I started collecting vinyl when I was probably 11 or 12 years old, which means I've been collecting it since 1967. Um, CDs I started to collect in the late 80s. Really, the early 90s is when I really started to pick up a lot more CDs. Uh, But but for me, anything that was real stereo, when I went to someone's house, if they had a real stereo setup and I got to hear music in a way that sounded realistic and, and uh, sort of compelling to me, it was going to be on vinyl. You know, so um, cassettes came along later. I do have a cassette collection, but I never thought of them as, as anything more than a convenience uh, or, or a way to own music that had gone out of print. And, you know, I had friends who had something and I said, well, make a copy for me. And then once it came in the print, I just I, I bought it on vinyl uh, so or CD. But really, in the end, for me, the roots of, of hi-fi would be vinyl. So that's actually even just to begin with that sentiment. That's a really interesting thought that cassettes were a convenience thing. Like at the time when cassettes came out, did you have a feeling that the, the quality just wasn't there? Like I think of cassettes and I, I don't think of quality. I, I think of like scratchy and this could just be my player, right? But like the scratchy sound of a cassette and it not kind of perfectly being in, in sync when the, the playheads don't align and, and little things like that. Well, at the time, was it was it seen as like a, a, a progression of an audio format or was it just? No, the only reason I got into cassettes and the reason my friends got into cassettes was because we could buy blank TDK chromium oxide tape, copy an album, and have it sound pretty good. Uh, you were losing a generation, but it still sounded uh, pretty legitimate. It still sounded analog, for one thing. Yeah. Uh, it was still a step away from vinyl. Pre-recorded cassettes, with rare, rare exceptions, um, did not sound good. They tended to fall apart. Uh, I know Ryko made some uh, some tapes in the early 90s that were done on Chrome, and they they were actually pretty good. And some of those I still have, and they're still pretty playable, and they sound good. Uh, but for the most part, cassette was, again, a convenience. That's why it ended up, you know, even before CDs uh, drove LPs out of the stores, uh, cassettes had already cut into the LP market. And the reason was everybody had a cassette player in their car. Mm. And it was convenient to play a cassette in the car. Uh, once Once CDs caught on, uh, within a few years, nobody had a cassette deck in the car. I mean, everybody was playing CDs in their cars. For sure. Uh, so that market was definitely, I would say, that more than anything else, cassettes were driven by uh, by people having cassette players in their cars or having boom boxes. Now, there is currently like a resurgence of cassette tapes. Like people are actually going out and, and trying to find cassette players and getting that retro vibe. If it's not for the quality aspect, it, is it just that retro feel of things? I think so. I think it's a novelty. I think it's much more a novelty uh, than vinyl. Um, 
you know, I, I think when people talk about vinyl appealing to younger people, uh, and and often they claim, well, they're they're actually still streaming music. They don't they don't listen to it on vinyl. Well, I've never seen data to back that up. Uh, right. I see it in almost every article about the resurgence of vinyl. They'll say, well, these kids are are not really listening to it uh, on LP. Well, go into any uh, Target, go into any Walmart, and you're going to see. Uh, a display of about 30 Crosley turntables. So for a hundred bucks, you get something that has, <laughs> in theory, an amplifier and, and a turntable and you you play the, the music through that. Um, but even if they were just streaming it, at least there's a large cover to look at. There's cover art, there's stuff that's going on that might make it interesting, even aside from it being on a on an LP. Cassettes, I honestly am at a loss to understand why the resurgence. I question whether it will last but it's certainly not driven by anything related to sound because again if you're buying pre-recorded tapes and that's what's driving this i don't think people are buying blank tapes to put music on they're buying pre-recorded tapes and unless they're taking the time to make them well and to to put them on decent tape uh even then uh, they're still not going to sound as good as, as a cd they're not going to sound as good as an lp they're not going to sound as good as something you're streaming uh, it's a it's a real compromise, and I think there's just something at work there that I don't really understand. Something trendy about the idea of having a cassette player because they they saw it in a movie or something like that. I think so. I think that's what it's about. Yeah. Now with vinyl, the the other interesting thing, and I always think about this this debate that vinyl sounds better, and um, it's very much a debate. I, I know people that say like, oh, vinyl is is the end all be all of hi fi. And then other people are like, well, the the bit rates and all this of a digital medium have far surpassed it. Is, from your point of view, is vinyl as popular as it is in hi-fi space because of the quality, because of that organic nature? Or is it because of the ritual of listening to vinyl? The idea of like taking it out and putting it on the record player and like that ritual aspect of it. I think it's a little bit of both. And I think it has to do if you're my age and I'm 67. So I've been collecting vinyl for more than 50 years and I've been listening to it on on good turntables and on on good gear, whether it's audio file or not. But it's at least high fidelity, I would say, yeah. entry level, high fire, whatever. But it's still I'm listening to it and I'm hearing music in a way that I think is accurate reproduction. Uh, so for me. Uh, up until recently, I would have said without hesitation that vinyl's better. Um, I of the younger folks, I just don't know. Um, my kids grew up with vinyl. Mm. My kids are in their twenties. I have my kids late, so they're yeah. you know they're they're used to hearing vinyl. Um, and I think to some extent, they do prefer it. But what they also like is yeah big album covers and the ritual of, uh, cause that is part of the vinyl experience. Uh, but as far as, you know, arguing that it is inherently superior again, up until maybe 10 years ago, I, I might've still held out. I mean, CD playback has improved probably every seven, seven to 10 years. Cause it's like, it's like computers. The technology yeah. has improved, but I would say any current CD player, made within the last probably five to seven years has a good enough digital to analog converter uh, that the playback is really pretty good. Uh, and it gives you a lot of the things that I really enjoy from vinyl. Uh, what I listen to, um, uh, or what I listen for in vinyl is certain certain things in, that, that I think digital sound was unable to produce uh, as strongly as vinyl um, until recently. And those things are things like um, bass attack, kick drum attack, uh, the real splash and sustain of a cymbal. Um, and now when I play, I mean, I've, I've bought uh, a new integrated amp uh, about two or three years ago. It's an NAD uh, C368. It's got an onboard DAC. And I run yeah. both of my players into that DAC. Well, the first week I had it, I didn't listen to vinyl because I was so amazed at the oh, CD playback. It was really impressive. Now, I've still gone back to it. I still listen to vinyl probably 70, 75% of the time. 
Um, but I really like vinyl play or a CD playback on this thing. I like, uh, I actually ended up buying the, uh, the Blue Os module for it. So I stream music through it. I oh, have a cool. bunch of music on an external drive and I, I stream that stuff through it as well. And all of those things that I was missing for a long, long time from digital sound are now there. Uh, you know, at this point, I have to say my preference for vinyl has to do with the tactile nature of holding an album cover and of putting a record on the turntable and cleaning it, which really focuses your uh, your attention. Your it's kind of like uh, I'm getting ready to listen to music now. So you know, yeah. part of that is I think I think it's really part of that. The tiny bit of preference that I have, I don't know anymore that I can say that it's anything other than something psychological, you know, and I'll, yeah. I'll cop to that. I'll cop to that, you know. It's an interesting idea, right? Because like um, I see vinyl as, as the ritualistic approach and and there's nothing wrong yeah. with that. It, you just said it like you focus in on the music like it's it's setting yourself up to really enjoy something. It's kind of like that delaying of pleasure and then you get to listen to this thing and you're all your attention's on it. And well, I think another thing that that to me makes it still may uh, perhaps preferable is mastering on some of the older LPs. Uh, the way mastering has been done over the last uh, probably 15 to 20 years is lots of compression, particularly pop music. It's yeah. a lot of compression uh, and a lot of decisions made uh, that I haven't agreed with. And so in some ways, what I like about the older recordings is they sound the way I expect them to sound. The new Stones things, for instance, uh, on Universal Music, all of the 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 things they've done, all the CDs they've released, uh, uh, post deck, uh, the stuff that started with like sticky fingers when they had their own label, all of that stuff is horribly compressed. Sounds terrible. Now, when Bob Ludwig did that, uh, the, uh, series in the, probably I'm going to say the mid to late nineties for Virgin music. Um, those sound pretty good. Those are, those are good sounding CDs. Uh, but the, anything that's been done since they went to, to universal music, just, uh, they, they sound terrible. So I would prefer to listen to those either on those older CDs or nine times out of 10, I'll listen to my, I mean, my copy of sticky fingers is a copy I bought in 1971. It's still clean. It still plays through and it sounds great. That's awesome. I take care of my vinyl. So, <laughs> wow. And, and th there's that other aspect of it, right? Like people, when, when you own vinyl, it's a commitment. Like you actually have to take care of it. You have to store it properly. You have to play it properly and, and all the things that are involved. Now, a, a kind of a, a thing that stuck out me, for me there was you were saying that uh, essentially the Stones remastered their content. And that new remastered is not what you enjoy and not what, um, kind of gives you that excitement of listening to the song. Um, one of the arguments that I always hear for vinyl is this idea that vinyl is closer to what the artist intended their music to sound like. But if we think about those remastered bits, well, they've remastered it and presumably they had the, the veto say to say, this is what I want my sound to sound like. And that is different. My assumption is the Stones don't care at this point. I think they may have cared when, and they have even cared when, when Bob Ludwig did the mastering for. Now, see, they don't own the, a, a large part of their catalog. The stuff prior to 1970 or 71 is, is owned by Abco. Uh, and actually, Bob Ludwig mastered those as well. But maybe they had some say in that. Yeah. You know, I, I think the Stones, per, uh, particularly when their records first came out, I think they had a real hand and how it was mastered stuff and it wouldn't surprise me to learn that that paul mccartney has uh, some say in how uh a lot of recent beatles things have been done you know because they sat with george martin interestingly enough to do the original mono stuff now they didn't care hmm. about the stereos when they left the room when they when when martin and and jeff emmerich and those guys did the stereo versions of it uh they cared about the mono sound but they were involved then and i as i say i think mccartney's probably still has some say in how they sound when they release them now uh whether the stones did but i doubt they had any input into um the the current releases for a couple of reasons i think first of all they want to appeal uh, to a younger group, because frankly, people my age and even people, you know, 25, 30 years younger, have, if they're going to buy that, they've already bought it. So yeah. it's a younger generation. And that younger generation is eight times out of 10 listening through computer speakers. Oh, so vinyl, it makes sense. People are assuming that you're listening to it on a hi-fi system. 
So that might sound a certain way on a hi-fi system, whereas a CD, people might be listening to it in a car uh, or on a portable player or, or kind of more or different sounds. So maybe the new releases are set up to sound better on those devices, on computer speakers versus on an actual hi-fi system. Could that be part of it at well, all? I remember when I still had an iPod and I didn't, uh, I, I didn't buy music through, through that. I, I ripped my CDs to put them on my iPod because when I was still working in an office, it was nice to have something to listen to. to so I, I wasn't distracted by my coworkers. Yeah. Um, but they had stuff on there that was specifically stated that it, it was mastered for iPod. It was mastered for ah, Apple. Ah, interesting. Uh, so I do think there are differences in approaches there. And that's one of my arguments for continuing to buy CDs is if you don't like the way a certain catalog sounds now, maybe go back to the previous release and you might find uh, preferable mastering there. You know, uh, I think a lot of times people say, well, uh, CDs will go the way that LPs were supposed to go, but now they've, they've come back a little bit. I think CDs will hang around. And, I, and one of the reasons, again, that I argue uh, for that is that streaming is nice. I like it well enough. But uh, if I want to hear um, certain catalogs the way that even in their best CD release, it might not be the current one. It might be one that was done a while back. Now, now do vinyl have that same variance? Like if you get a vinyl pressed um, in, let's say, North America, or or one batch of vinyl pressed for a specific artist, would there be a variance in the sound and in the quality between another batch or another um, place that's pressing the same vinyl? There could be subtle differences between pressing plants. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, even now, uh, because I was I was just um, um, talking to somebody um, about the differences between, say, the Blue Note Classic series now and the Tone Poet series, and one of the differences is that. Uh, the Tone Poet series is pressed at RTI in California, which is one of the one of the best plants in the world. There are really three or four plants that are at the very top. So RTI, which right. is Record Technology Incorporated, Quality Record Pressings in Salina, Kansas, or I guess it's Salina, Kansas. Uh, and then there's uh, Palace in Germany. Those are the three top plants. They do really good work. They use old style presses, which use a little bit more pressure and take a little bit longer. So the impression in the vinyl is a little bit better. Now, the classic vinyl series is pressed at... Um, um, it, they're pressed in Germany. I can't offhand uh, optimal optimal media in Germany. Okay, uh, good plant, but they use newer presses, and they don't they don't seem to press quite as long, and they don't make quite the impression. There's a little bit of difference in sound. Uh, now, years ago, if you bought say a Bob Dylan album and it was pressed at a plant in the Midwest, it might sound different from the one that was pressed on the East Coast. And if it was pressed ah. on a stamper that was that maybe had too many, uh, you know, the, too many impressions were made and it wore down a little bit that way. Yeah. The sound. That's what a lot of people argue is the um, it's either one of the things that makes vinyl really a flawed process or it makes for somebody like me. Uh, it makes it kind of exciting because you might stumble on a really great pressing that sounds exceptional. You know? Interesting. Uh, the, but, um, yes, you could have variances in that now. As far as masterings, yeah, I mean, some of the Blue Note catalog has been reissued many times over. And, you know, Rudy Van Gelder did the original master. It sounds a certain way. When the company was sold to, to Liberty Records, uh, you know, and I think it was in the late 60s or early 70s, well, somebody else came along and mastered it. Sometimes Van Gelder still mastered them. But in some occasions, uh, somebody else came along. They might have been reissued three or four more times. And then now you've got Kevin Gray doing them. And uh, and those those are really good, but some of the '70s reissues uh, don't don't sound that good. They could sound uh, they may be all analog, but they don't sound that great. So, for new artists, do you buy vinyl from like more contemporary artists, or is it really the vinyl that you're after is the stuff that's actually produced on the full analog system? No, I, I, in fact, some of the stuff I review, I just, uh, I just submitted a review of a band called On Attendant Anna, a uh, French group. And uh, I, re I reviewed their last, last release on CD, but I reviewed the current one on vinyl. I try to do new vinyl for a couple of reasons. In fact, uh, I, I reviewed uh, uh, an album by a group called Savak from Brooklyn uh, within the last 
uh, six months or so. Uh, great records, beautifully pressed. I, and frankly, very often if I buy something, especially if I'm reviewing it, I'll buy it on vinyl because I want to try to get some newer artists in. I want to tr- I want to pull younger readers in. I want to I want to create young audiophiles. Yeah. It's really part of my goal. Is I really want want young people to become part of this hobby. And we're not going to do it by by going over the same old records. We need to we need to cover some current stuff. Awesome. So with that, uh, let's go ahead and take a quick break to listen to some music. uh, And we'll be back in just a minute. Okay. And coming back from the break, we're still here with uh, Joseph Taylor. Joseph, a thought that I just had was when we're talking about uh, vinyl and kind of drawing the parallel in my mind to the film industry and their kind of love for film versus digital recording a, a video and this idea that there's something organic about it, that you, it's very hard to articulate what it is that feels different when you're watching a movie that's recorded on film versus on digital. Well, I read something years ago. A guy named David Denby wrote a piece for The New Yorker called My Problem with Perfection, and it's when CDs first came out. And he was talking about something that resonated with me, which is that some of the most moving experiences he had with music were listening on his transistor radio in his room. You know, which is crummy sound. Yeah. Uh, and, and he asked James Taylor about digital sound. Now, I know, I think James Taylor re- does record digitally now, but at the time, and this would have been probably 25 years ago, he said, I don't like digital. There's no, there's no ground beneath it. There's no foundation in a way. Now, I, again, I, I don't think that's the case anymore. I, I, but there's still something that seems to flow more naturally because, uh, you know, our publisher, Doug Schneider, has asked a couple of times, why would you buy uh, an LP that's a, from a digital recording? Well, as, as soon as a needle hits a groove, to me, it's analog, even if it was yeah. recorded digitally. because It's analog and it and it sounds that way. You know, a recording like The Nightfly by Donald Fagan, which was, uh, you know, it was originally, it's a digital recording. And uh, I have a CD. I vastly prefer the the vinyl. I don't know why. I just think it sounds more uh, soulful. It sounds, uh, you know, um, and and I'm, I don't, you know, I like a a record to sound good. And that record sounds good in both formats. But there's just something to me a little more, um, for lack of a better term, it just sounds a little more musical on vinyl to me. Yeah. Um, And that's a subjective thing. But this is a pretty subjective hobby. So. Well, and that's um, totally know. fair. And I think your point that as soon as the record hits the groove, it's analog. Like once, yeah. even a digital um, master that's getting pressed onto a vinyl, when it's getting pressed onto a vinyl, it is getting turned into an analog format. And therefore, there's, whether it's um, good or bad, there's there's something there that is analog that yeah may have started digital, but is now an analog format being reproduced. So. Music is vibration. And to me, digital, even in good form, is still vibration is not occurring until this, it hits the speakers. Ah. It's still zeros and ones and information. It's data. Whereas a stylus is vibration. Well, when you and I, you and I talking, our voices are vibrating. Well, when a stick hits a drum, uh, the, the head vibrates, the snare underneath vibrates, my guitar strings vibrate when I play them, and so on. And so when you re- when you start, by recreating the sound of that music by a needle dragging through a, you know, uh, this valley yeah. <laughs> and starting to vibrate. To me, that's, that makes all the difference in the world. I love that. I've never heard that take on vinyl before. Uh, that's really cool. I like that. Yeah, that to me is what makes it special and continues to make it special to me. Even as much as I've grown to really like digital, and I do appreciate it a lot more than I ever have. And yet, when I play, uh, you know, uh, uh, my copy of Sticky Figures that I bought when I was 15 or 14, yeah. um, it still sounds terrific to me. And it has just a, 
you know, a really ripping, rocking quality that that somehow uh, even the Bob Ludwig Master CD just doesn't have. I don't know why that is. Uh, you know, and it, I think it's years of it's it's hardwiring psychology is what it yeah. is. It's it's my brain has has really settled on that sound and did all those years ago, and and everything that's come after just doesn't doesn't seem to supplant that for me. <laughs> I mean, that's totally fair. You obviously love music. And it, like I, reading some of your articles and looking at some of the, the content that you produce, it's a vast array of music. The question yes. that I have is, do you consider yourself an audiophile or are you a music enthusiast that uses the best equipment possible to get that sound off of whatever medium it is to your ears? I think the second is probably a more accurate description. And I also think there's a time when if you had asked me, if I'm an audiophile, I would have said I'm as much an audiophile as I can afford to be. <laughs> um, uh, but the truth is, too, I spend a lot of money on music. So music is my emphasis. Uh, and I have what I consider to be probably entry level hi-fi or audiophile gear. But when I listen to audiophiles, in particular, when I read some audiophile journalists, I realize um, maybe I'm not an audiophile. I heard a, a, a leading audiophile journalist answer a question uh and the question was how much do you need to spend for a turntable to be audiophile and he said five thousand dollars and yikes uh, with a fifteen hundred dollar cartridge and i thought well that's just ridiculous i mean most people in the world would look at both of my stereo setups and they'd say well that's idiotic to spend that much money and, <laughs> yeah. and my, my both my systems are well under 10 grand and both my turntables are probably in about the $1200 range and both my cartridges are probably in about the 3 or 400 dollar range not that I wouldn't spend more I, I probably at some point would <clears throat> but I think that you can I think some people focus too much on gear and <laughs> but I mean I have I, it's not unusual to go onto audiophile groups and see people who have six figure systems and own 50 CDs. <laughs> you know? yeah. And then you realize they're more gear driven than music driven. I think now not everyone's that way. There are plenty of audiophiles who really love music, who really have big collections and are committed to music and they love it. They even love the, the kinds of, of uh, reproduction that really expensive equipment can produce. I have to tell you, when I go to audio shows, I hear a lot of systems that I really like. I, I usually hear a handful of systems that I think sound leagues better than what I have. Not necessarily better, but more detailed and are so good that I stop in my tracks and say, wow. But there are a lot of really expensive systems that I, I stand in the demo room and I think this really doesn't sound that much better than what I'm listening to at home. Um, look, if I could see myself. If I bought fewer records, I could probably have a, a, a really nice VPI turntable. And they are really nice. Jason Thorpe, who writes for us, I know he has a really nice setup and he has a really great turntable. He has a, a nice VPI turntable. I oh. probably should have one. But I, in order to afford that, I'd have to buy fewer records. And I'm not going to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy with my playback yeah. uh, that I get. Uh, I I would, I, I think maybe um, I would upgrade, uh, you know, cartridges uh, on both mine. Um, I'll tell you one thing, though, is, is I've learned of, over all these years of doing this is particularly with turntables. And this is more than any other piece of equipment. They are very t uh, tweak responsive, you know, especially the new like I have two project tables and, uh, you know, I have worked uh, to I have isolation tables I built for them. And also some of the some of the projects have a, a an upgrade path, which is kind of nice because you can, you know, little changes like a, a sub platter and a platter and so on can really change the sound of the turntable. Uh, and and I kind of like that. That's something that I enjoy doing. Uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, if I had a financial windfall, I, I'm sure I'd, I'd first thing I do is really buy a nice turntable because I love vinyl and, and it would be cool. They're kind of fun to look at, you know, even the ones oh, I yeah. have are kind of fun to look at, you know. Um, so you have that design aspect and performance and it's fun to watch that thing spin. And after all these years, I still get that thrill of watching the record spinning on on that platter it's it's i don't know there's something uh, oddly romantic i guess about it i don't know what it is uh, uh, what it is is years and years and years of having that experience i right. think it's a, it's a bit magical like if you think about it yeah. it's magical they they were able to figure out how these little grooves in this piece of vinyl was able to reproduce a sound Pure magic. Right. Well, um, and it's a, it's a, it, it, technically it's a more than, it's probably 150 years old technology. It, it, it kicked in as far, once you got magnetic tape so that you could really clearly 
record things. I mean, the difference between something that was done in the 20s, like a Louis Armstrong recording, and maybe a Miles Davis recording in the 50s, uh, the difference in sound is because you had better technology to actually capture that sound. In the early days, they had to use stuff that just didn't last as long intended to. So you're going to have to put up with a lot of noise with a, a Louis Armstrong recording because it's inherent in how they recorded it. It was a much more delicate medium. Um, whereas tape really seems to last, you know, you, you have to be careful. I mean, uh, as we learned from the, the recent MoFi scandal, you know, you don't want to hit that tape too many times. Yeah. Uh, you have to be, and record companies are going to watch you on that. You know, that's probably what led them to make the decision they made, uh, uh with, the, with those recordings. Uh, it was because I'm sure the record company said, well, no, we're not going to let you come back and, and grab this thing after a thousand copies. You know, you have to make some more lasting copy. Uh, so there is some uh, care that you need to take with it. But it's at the same time, some of these tapes are really, really old. Um, but just quickly, you know, you're talking about uh, how people hear things and, and whether it makes a difference in, in their experience. I had two piano players at one time. Um, over the house because I'm I'm a musician and I know other musicians and and these guys were listening to uh, I have a really nice classic records pressing of Kind of Blue I was playing it for them one looked yeah. at the other and he said I feel like I'm in the room with the musicians and that's your goal when you yeah. listen you know neither of them went out and bought a good stereo system sure and so it, it's important to me it, they liked hearing it but it's not important enough for them to say I'm going to invest in this because no most musicians I know don't really listen in the same way uh even music enthusiasts listen i'm i'm kind of unusual in that i i probably enjoy listening to music more than i do playing it you know oh interesting um, i'm driven more to listen and even to write about it than i am to play my wife and i play in a band i enjoy it but uh it's it's uh i'm not dr necessarily driven to do it you know so do you think most musicians are audiophiles or do they enjoy the production of music and the the idea of listening to the playback is kind of that secondary or tertiary thing to them? I'd say they're not audiophiles. And to the extent that they're involved in production, care about production, it's impact more than sound that they want, you know. Uh, okay. Look, you know, uh, someone like uh, Phil Spector made records that influenced a lot of people. Um, they are not audiophile records, you know, they yeah. are not great recordings. They're very layered. There's, they're crammed with information. So when Bruce Springsteen did Born to Run, <clears throat> he's very influenced by Phil Spector. And uh, from an audiophile perspective, I don't know that Bruce has made any record that I would say is an audiophile record. I wouldn't, uh, I don't know that the Stones did, you know. Uh, rock and roll is, is um, you know, a record like Dark Side of the Moon, which really is an audiophile recording. That's more the exception, I think, than the rule. With, with rock music. Very cool. Now, um, Joseph, for everything that we talked about so far, really interesting. There's so many different examples of artists that you kind of have dropped and, and I picked up on. Um, this kind of leads me into talking about one of your columns, which is Curator, which is looking at all these different types of artists. How do you choose an artist to look at? How do you, how, how does your brain curate the music that you listen to. This column really was suggested by our publisher, Doug Schneider. He called me five years ago and said it would be an interesting idea to look at records that were important in, I think he said pop music history. And one of the reasons um, he, he was saying he was talking to some younger people who were music fans. I don't know if they were audiophiles, but they were definitely music fans. And they were wondering what are the great records and why are they considered to be great? Yeah. Um, so when he suggested, I thought it was a good idea. The first one I chose was Rubber Soul because it's probably, it's my favorite Beatles album and one of my favorite uh, records, period. Uh, so I, I, I did that one. The next one was, uh, I think, uh, Hymns to the Science by Van Morrison because Doug and I had talked a few times about, about what a great record that is. Now, Van's made a number of great records, but I thought, let's choose one that is – not as well known as Moon Dance or, or Astral Weeks. Let's let's choose something that's a great record and maybe need some attention. Now, some of the others, uh, Forever Changes by Love, again, it's kind of a key record, but not as well known outside, uh, you know, a group of people who really follow rock music uh, for the last 60 or 70 years and know that it's probably an important record. 
Um, uh, so that's why I chose that one. And I chose the Allman Brothers at Fillmore East just because it's one of my favorite records. And it's a record that I still, after more than 50 years, hear new things every time I play it, you know, even mm-hmm. after all this time listening to it. As I went on, I realized that some artists, it's not an album by album thing. It's someone like Laura Nero made four records that really crystallized her genius. She made other records mm-hmm. that are really pretty good. But those four records are the ones that matter. Um, I will say that Doug's been pretty and he's, he's he's let me pretty much write about. He's never suggested that I cover something. He's yeah. let me do uh, whatever I want to write and uh, whatever I want to cover. So mm-hmm. uh, I have to say uh, he's indulged me more than I would have indulged <laughs> myself uh, or if I were him. Um, and so sometimes it's a matter of uh, someone like, OK, What's Going On is a great and important record. It's also a record that was a result of a really difficult relationship that Marvin Gaye had with Barry Gordy at Motown. You yeah. know, he, Gordy stood in his way uh, almost throughout his career. And, uh, you know, it was Marvin Gaye and Stevie Wonder who changed Motown's direction. They were a singles label. And they became more an album label after that. So when I started to write about Marvin Gaye, there was so much interesting in his career that led up to what's going on. I realized I can't focus on the album. I really have to I have to really lead people through what he had done up to that record. Mm. Then I thought, well, I've written about about Marvin Gaye. What about Stevie Wonder? One of the great musicians, uh, you know, probably one of the great post-war American musicians, certainly one of the great musicians of the uh, 60s and 70s. And again, a guy who took Motown in a, in a direction it needed to go if it was if it was going to remain relevant and made a series of great records, even his early career, because he's, he was signed when he was 12. Wow. And did these really cool records. And so I said, I, I need to cover those and say, OK, this is a guy who came uh, as an adult to a really amazing and creative career. Uh, but but also had uh, uh, some interesting records as a young man and some experiences as a young man that led him to be able to make that kind of music. And so that was the, the interesting story. A band like XTC, 20 year career, uh, different kinds of records in that career. And so to, to cover each of those, uh, well, more each of their uh, sort of the periods of their records. At some point, if you're going to cover a, a career that long, you really have to be selective and say, OK, some of these records deserve more attention than others. Some of them might be worth a passing mention. They might be worth having. But the ones that are really good and the ones that are really um, uh, worth looking at, the, the four or five records in their career uh, that, that I think are really standout records, I'll give those a little more attention. Point to the other ones and why they might be worth having. But these are the ones that are really, uh, really key. So it, it, from band to band. Yeah, uh, it it really it, it you know I like when I chose to write about Spirit, it's because I think Spirit is one of the great late sixties, early seventies bands and deserves uh, more attention than it gets. And they made a series of, of of really good records. So let's look at those. Let's make a, again after the original band broke up, they they made some they continued to make music, but it wasn't wasn't really that good. So let's let's look at the the early ones. Talk about what happened later, but do that, you know, in passing. Now, the one that was a real challenge was James Brown, because Jay, I, which I just submitted and should appear next month. Uh, it's probably the longest piece I've written. Well, James Brown was not an album driven guy, really. He made some great albums, but most of his career, most of the really significant records he made that continue to have an influence on music, um, they were singles. Interesting. And so it depends with each artist you're going to you're going to look at. But, but Laura Nero was a turning point for me because I realized some artists, you can't really look at just an album. You really have to look at uh, maybe a, a sequence of albums that really define yeah. them. Very cool. Now, you mentioned earlier that you have kids. They're in their 20s. Yeah. And that you are trying to develop the next generation of audiophile. So I'm sure that your musical interests and how you have brought them up knowing about vinyl and being exposed to all this different type of music has influenced them in their music appreciation and, and their love of music. Have they influenced you yeah. in any of their stuff? And is there any like contemporary stuff that you wouldn't have expected you liked as much, uh, but you appreciate and, and maybe the influence from your children helped you appreciate that? Uh, some bands that they like, uh, I'm not a big panic at the disco fan, you know, okay. for instance, <laughs> um, 
And there are other bands that I think it's, it's, they like them, but I don't, but you know, I'm kind of proud that Embargo likes Captain Beefheart, you know, and Aaron likes, uh, um, like the bird stuff, you know, uh, but yeah. they like their own music too. And Margo's a hip hop fan. And, uh, there is some hip hop that I've grown to really appreciate, particularly people like Kendrick Lamar, just because the, the rhyme schemes and some of the things going on there are really pretty compelling. Yeah. But as an art form talking over music, just never, it doesn't grab me the same way. I can appreciate the talent in sampling and things like that. I can appreciate that a group like public enemy had a real social conscience, uh, behind you know, behind what they were doing. But uh, for the most part, it, I, I would know, I wouldn't feel qualified to write about that just in the same way I wouldn't feel qualified to write about opera. You know, Got it's it. just not an art form that I understand well enough. Oh, that's fair. Now, the last question that I have in my brain for you is, is what's the soundtrack to your life? If, if there was uh, a couple songs that you could put on repeat uh, for an extended period of time or, or one song that always sticks out as your favorite, What's the soundtrack what, or what's that song? Uh, you know, uh, I still think that, and it'll almost sound like a cliche, but I think in my life on, on Rubber Soul uh, moves me as much as probably the first time I heard it. I think it's a great song and it's probably, it may have been overplayed, but, but I still, I still like it. I think it's a beautiful song. Uh, that's one. I think, um, I think the best four minutes of music ever recorded is, is probably Hendrix's version of All Along the Watchtower. Uh, another recording that every time I hear it, I'm just amazed at everything that's going on in it. You know, the way he, he had, uh, uh, he, I think uh, Dave Mason plays the 12 string acoustic guitar that's in the background, and it's almost used more as percussion than, than for the, the chords that he's playing. Although he is playing the chords, it's just the sound of it creates a more percussive kind of feel. And uh, the guitar solo, the way it's structured, it's it's in two or three different sections, and it still locks me out. And Mitch Mitchell's, uh, you know. So if I had one record that I would say is at the pinnacle of recorded history, it would be that that song. I just I just think it's. I think Hendrix was an astonishing musician, the same way Charlie Parker was for jazz. I mean, he really changed the direction of the music. Um, you know, and the Beatles had already done that. Elvis had already done that. But to me, as an instrumentalist, particularly, I think he he really was uh, still is probably, uh, you know, there are there are only a few rock guitar players who had the complete command of the instrument that he had. But that song. Yeah, I would say that it's hard to say if I had, a, you know, if I was on that uh, that desert island that everybody talks <laughs> about, I I'd take the Allman Brothers at Phil Maurice, because, again, uh, after all these years, when I wrote about it, one of the things that struck me was um, how um, how I was still hearing things that I hadn't caught all the other times I'd listened to it. It just surprised me. Uh, that that a, a record can still bring new things uh, you know, to me that I can still. And, and there are a lot of records like that, you know, for me, um, you know, a lot of Miles Davis's records are like that. Uh, Astral Weeks by Van Morrison is like that for me. So um, records that uh, as, as much as I know them, they still they still sh bring new things to me. That's awesome. Now, I, I might have lied. This is the last question that I have. Okay. On, on that desert island example you mentioned, would you bring two records and a record player, or would you bring a pack of cassettes and a cassette player with you? Oh, I'd bring a record player and records. But only two. You know, I could I could live I could live with with uh, you know cassettes, but I guess if I had to, but I would bring the almonds at Fillmore East, and then. Uh, huh. I would, I, you know, I, I have so many records that I like. I might bring a Django Reinhardt record because there's so much joy in Django Reinhardt's in that original Quintet of the Hot Club of Paris. That might be my second record just because, you know, if you're there by yourself all the time, you want something that's gonna, gonna bring put you, you in a good mood and that, and that music does that for me. Oh, that's awesome. Well, I absolutely appreciate the conversation. It was fantastic. I, uh, I really enjoyed it. Um, I did there, too. It's nice meeting you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's very nice meeting you. The first time we get to chat is uh, is on the podcast. Um, if people are interested in uh, reading uh, some of your articles or stuff like that, where would you send them? Well, uh, with soundstage experience, now that I'm the senior editor, one of the things we're I think we're going to try more and more to do is is move the site to uh, focusing on music, mostly recorded music as it comes out whether on reissue or, or uh, whether it's something new. 
I write uh, Soundstage uh, Ultra. I, I do vinyl reviews on that, at least for now. I don't know uh, where we might move that to. in the future. We might want to take that over to Soundstage Experience. But for now, if you want to read vinyl reviews every month, I, I always review an LP for uh, Soundstage Ultra. And then um, I'm also on Soundstage Experience doing other music reviews uh, in various formats, sometimes a download, sometimes uh, it'll be an LP and sometimes it'll be a CD. So those are the places really, Soundstage Experience and Soundstage Ultra. Now you'll find some older pieces I've written on some of the other Soundstage uh, microsites too. Um, if you do probably my name, uh, just Joseph Taylor and Soundstage, you'll you'll probably be able to link to some of the older pieces on some of the other sites. Awesome. Very much appreciated. Thank you so much, Joseph. And for everyone else, take care. All the best. See you later.